we end up with these things that are really hidden, these enclosed and potentially distributed uh, um, code platform systems that we're working on. Um, and really, you know, when we see the government, you know, the traditional practices favor that very, very binary thing that we see open all sorts. Um, and really what we wanted to start to really think about is how we add a few more colors in our rubbish um, so that we can have this kind of continu open continuum of, um, you know, inner source becoming that key capability or that key piece for us to get better nuance in the organization. So, you know, inner source is really, you know, those open source practices behind the firewall. Um, and what we started to really look at were around those areas of improving discovery, improving collaboration, and the transparency of these things. So for us, um, you know, it is really starting to rethink about how we do engineering practices inside the organization. So a little bit about our road to inner source. Um, so we really started to think about what our core principles would be. Now, so much of the work that we've done is, is standing on the rest of the um, community around the inner source commons um, and, and you know the open source community as a whole. So much of that was really starting to think about those core principles that we looked at. The openness, you know, being able to discover code internally um, and the documentation of knowledge that follows. Transparency, the being able to uh, look across the organization, you know, following these practices that you know as open source practitioners we're probably very, very familiar with. Um, and the collaborative piece, which typically hasn't been done when teams are working very, very solid in their organizations, but this is a way of starting to really rethink, um, but also change how we uh, engage, how we start to do mentorship, how we start to do learning, how we start to really bring that network effect into play to um, really think of how we scale this more importantly. So you know, what we really started to think about was what are these core foundations for us in, in a source journey. That really started with the platform, and uh, last year we, we started on a journey of, of taking, um, you know, moving towards a central source code platform, um, and you know, along with that, really the practices and the people. In any kind of transformation journey, we see that there's you know, three key pieces that, that come in there: the practices, establishing guidelines, working off what we start to see in the industry, as well as the commons as a, as a really critical part. As, you know, so much great work has been done uh, out there. We didn't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel. We wanted to be able to get to, you know, change faster by leveraging what's been done already. People as well. I think we, um, you know, we start to, to see that engagement across the organization is, is such an important part, raising awareness. All of these things that, you know, um, we thought would have been a little bit more obvious, but interesting, and I'll share a little bit later, the lessons learned as we go through and all this, um, there were a few assumptions that I made a mistake on, but it was a really good learning journey to understand the organization. So last year we began this journey, we, we migrated you know, what was a fairly disparate platforms from the Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub to the world, into a central uh, managed GitLab repository, which really started our journey and, and enabled that platform. Um, and you know that was a bit of a bottleneck as well because I mean it didn't quite factor in some of the uptake. To migrate a very large set of repositories, we're probably halfway through, and we've probably discovered probably about you know just under ten thousand code repositories across the organisation that we need. Um, we're halfway through that journey, so it's a bit of a challenge, and that's slowed things down at least for our adoption. Um, and but what we did do very early on before the platform was ready was really establish this community of practice, um, what we call the inner source working group inside the organization. We called in a number of different divisions in Belfair to really establish this group that we could start to, you know, both set up communications channels, our monthly sync ups, and as well as at least finding repositories that we could start to work on to, to build out the practice. Um, and interestingly, the leadership was actually very, very supportive of the whole thing. So, um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about why we found other challenges. But you know, going off some of the, uh, the other pieces, we started to frame these sorts of three stages. And this builds up the commons in terms of the maturity models and things about you know, these stages of inner source adoption. I think the obvious piece is yes, you know, at level zero, we've got closed source code. Um, and that's the default assumption for most of the organization. Um, moving up to the next level, 
um, readable source, being able to really see all that code that's available. And then going on to accepting contributions, or and then going on to something that is potentially community owned and maintained. And so that's where we started to really frame about not only how we think about inner source coming into the organization, but also how we start to report um, success. But there was a really interesting sort of quote that came about in our adoption of open source. So um, when we first started off there, you know, um, you know, if, if we're familiar with something with open source, it's permissionless. Um, but inside an organization which is fairly structured, I found teams that were engaging with coming and knocking on the door and saying, oh, uh, do we need to get permission from you guys to, to, to win this sort of these projects? And, um, you know, perhaps a blind spot on my part in thinking that, well, okay, anyone can just go and do it, just open turn your project internal, adopt some, some practices, and you're good to go. But it actually meant we had to spell it out. We had to be very, very clear to say, okay, go and do it with what you do. And, and this is where we started to really frame it into two different models. You know, much like the, um, you know, the wider community, we have this kind of model where, you know, there is this self-initiated uh, open source, or in the source in this case, the teams can do it in what we call a project-initiated manner. You know, they open source the code, they release it out there, and it supports the, probably the two layers of that triangle at the bottom to say that kind of readable source, or yes, contributions, because it's owned by a particular team. We then step across the community side, which is very much what like we see with a lot of the big open source foundations, where you know, these projects may in fact be donated centrally or managed centrally. All of those sorts of things that we see of as these things that are general utility or things that may be sort of bigger than an individual project team. Um, and so that's a kind of multi-ownership model, those sorts of things. And, and what we are now starting to really think about is, well, you know, if a project does want to be donated centrally, what's the sorts of criteria that will be accepted? You know, much like an open source foundation, CNCF, you know, Venice Foundation, all of those sorts of things about you know, what are these sort of acceptance criteria as well as the ongoing expectations for those sorts of things? You don't want people throwing code repository over the wall and it's a dead again, again, you know, That's not necessarily always bad, but we just need to be cognizant that you know, these things probably should have some shepherding going along. And so as part of all of this, we started to really sit down with the working group and develop some uh, practice guidelines. Now, um, we didn't want this to be you know, the typical government mandate to say, you know, now must do this and, and then must follow these sorts of things. We wanted it to be somewhat organic. Um, and so we came up to really align around those principles around these three core areas. And these are these sorts of fairly um, you know, lower areas, these sorts of patterns that we start to see around standard documentation, the readings and the contributing markdown documents, you know, obviously switching to internal is such a key piece of any of that. Um, as well as you know, licensing, and I'll go a little bit more in, into how we went about creating an inner source license inside the organization. Um, the other piece is, and this was interesting, that you know, the kind of merge and pull request culture never really existed inside the organization to a wide extent. So we also then had to go along the way and explain why merge requests and pull requests were such an important part, how we go about doing that, how in fact can change from you know, traditional change change advice reports in, in enterprise organizations to something that gives us better time to market as well as better confidence. The reality is we're a somewhat low trust organization, um, or at least we have to have confidence in the code that we're putting into our systems because our citizen data is actually you know, gated and verified. Um, but that actually aligns very nicely with their kind of open source practices too. Issue trackers, now I think there's always this kind of piece about, you know, in an enterprise organization, we've probably got some Jira here and some confluence over there and really setting that expectation that, yeah, I mean, a lot of teams will still maintain it and do that. A lot of people really love Jira for some reason. But at the same time, you know, there is, you know, we need to have something that is accessible and is actually visible for those teams who do want to contribute and learn about things. And that's where we start to see labeling and licensing, kind of, sorry, labeling and, and ticketing practices that can start to enable migration at the scale as well as the kind of decision-making processes, you know, coming and thinking about documentation as code, architecture decision records, design documents that get placed in the code repositories. Very, very fundamental shift to how we operate in government, probably very fundamentally different to how we operate in enterprises operate in some cases too. And that became not just about saying, yeah, everyone go and do open source and you've got to do it. It actually meant we had to kind of bring the organization along with this as well. 
And finally, that kind of piece about, well, we have actually team roles, we have team structures. These are very, very important when we start to really think about. And so, you know, I think we're probably fairly familiar with the types of roles that we see in the open source community, both from contributors to, to code reviewers and maintainers. You know, these are the sorts of things that we're now starting to formalize in roles that people can come on board, particularly just in the shepherding of the ownership process. Um, and that one is, you know, just um, you know, an ongoing piece as we start to see how these sorts of fit. I mean, I think government likes to have formal roles and things. We're trying to avoid it being that kind of delegation of control, but it's certainly something that we want to enable and encourage collaboration. So an important part, because you know the government, while it looks like a single entity, is not that each agency is you know its own legal entity across a very wide so, you know, set of different teams and also of vendors as well. So we sat down with our legal department um, and worked through what we call the GovTech public sector license. Now that one is something specific to GovTech for collaboration is based on um, you know, permission, uh, you know, sort of um, permissive licenses, um, basically MIT with a few extensions. Um, and that really started to talk about our expectations of um, the use of code, um, both by other agencies as well as the vendors, um, as well as what happens when contributions are contributed back and who owns it. And that sort of set the expectation and gave a bit of their cover to those teams who are starting to open source their project, or sorry, to open source their projects. In most, you know, common practice, putting a license file in the repository, potentially putting it in source code files, you know, is the way we've gone about doing those sorts of things. So um, that was just a bit of a kind of a hygiene piece, but an important part to really get confidence as we started to roll it out. Now, you know, measurement's always a critical part. It's really quite interesting. We started off this journey and management was like, yes, we love the idea, go and do it. Um, but then, you know, the next question is always, how do you measure it? And this was not something that was necessarily funded. Um, this is something that a group of us started up the working community. We work with now uh, source code management platform to get resources available to start to open these sorts of things up. But at the end of the day, we still want to be able to know if we're doing a good job or things are improving. So we really started to think about what are really these core base metrics that we could start on. What's the easiest thing to get started? Um, and obviously, the most obvious piece is kind of project instability, knowing if it's internal or if it's closed. That's that kind of binary piece. We want to start to see how we get more nuance in there as we go forward. Best practice was another piece that we wanted to say. Yeah, um, we have a, you know, an automated script, a tool that will actually go and look at a project and see, have you put in a readme, have you put in a licensing file, and then give you a bit of a report back. And the kind of next jump is to say, well, let's also make it even easier or raise a pull request to give you those files if you're lacking them as well. So this is not just about the measurement, but also the enablement piece as well. Um, and then finally, kind of these three stages of adoption, which we're getting to next, as I showed the, the kind of the triangle. Um, we want to see not just the breadth, how many people are starting to use in the source, but also you know, how many are starting to contribute, how many are starting to have multiple maintainers or contributors as well. And so still a very basic metric, and that's the thing that we're starting on. Next, once we get a bit more volume, um, we can really start to get more nuance in there. But because practice is still basic, um, we wanted to really get things moving first, and then we start to report. But even though we started to really kind of crunch the numbers for project visibility, Probably not as fast as we were expecting because we got some gazing in there, but at least the numbers are starting to show where we can really start to think about and improve. So inside of GovTech, you know, we've actually gone, the working groups obviously dog fooding everything that we do. Um, a lot of our internal platforms, our CI CD, our cloud platforms are starting to inner source all of the code that we can. Um, things like how do we provision accounts in all of these CSPs? Um, how do we start to enable monitoring? IDC, all of this kind of stuff. But the other kind of bigger discussion is, in fact, how do we think, change things for the organization? Now, as much as this, we don't necessarily want to make it a mandate. Having open source by default, we want to change the mentality as we can. And so that's um, you know, somewhere that we're really starting now to discuss with management. You know, is this something we do for GovTech? Isn't then something that potentially can roll out to the rest of the organization as well? And so a few of the lessons learned, I touched a little bit on that. You know, uh, having code platforms available and ready is such a big part. Migration has really actually hindered that. So you know, although we can do in a source, 
um, across a gamut of different projects, it really changes the model. Having a central code platform means we can you know, have that network effect rather than jumping back and forth. And so at least it's an easier starting point than really scrolling out, say, in a source portal and getting agreement for each of the project teams to share their resources or share their in the source project. So that gives us a little bit of a central visibility piece. Um, but not necessarily something critical. You know, seeing the community is always such an important part. You know, saying you want to do in source doesn't necessarily mean it actually follows through. We need to go and sit down, we need to do brown bags or sharing with all of the different software engineering communities, developed communities across the organization to, to raise awareness as a start. You know, permission is not required, as I said. You know, we didn't want it to be the assumption that you know everyone needed permission to do in source. It needs to be permissionless, but we also needed to make sure that it was communicated and documented because the assumption was the other way around. Everyone needed to knock on our door and say, please, please go do it. We didn't want that. And really finding the right allies and supporters, that was the other piece. Um, getting leadership support was easy. We went to our senior leaders, we you know, presented pretty much what was the start of this day, and they said, yes, go and do it. Um, talking to the developers, I think everyone was probably quite familiar with um, and. You know, as part of that, you know, they were kind of, yeah, we're supported, but the middle management was always a challenge, as it is in so many big organizations. Finding time, finding resources that, you know, the developers then could go and work on these sorts of projects became an important time. And so it actually meant going around and knocking on doors um, and, you know, helping those teams, helping and convincing them that there is actually benefit on those sorts of things too. So it actually meant in this kind of organization to go around and do a lot of manual work. And so finally, you know, starting off on your own journey, I mean, we established a community of practice. Um, you know, the guidelines and patterns that came out of the commons were such a great resource, and I'm hoping that we can contribute some back in the future. Um, as well as really starting small, you know, you know big bank government likes to do a big bank, kind of try and solve everything in one go, but at the end of the day, like most initiatives, it takes time to really grow and scale. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much. Um, if you, on the other hand, are interested in coming to join us on this journey, we're hiring, but um, you know, come and join our working group, come and help us drive in a source across the organization too. So, thank you very much. Uh, we have a bit of a jam in the schedule, so we should be speaking with the South next talk right now. However, uh, Mike, are you in the room? Our uh, next speaker does not be in the room anyway. So, uh, questions? I think there's one here. Oh, here, I'm sorry. Um, so the, the British government did a very radical thing, the, the IT service, decided to put the code on the public GitHub, including their roadmaps. So is that a step on how to bridge inner source with open source because you may probably be absorbing open source internally? Is there a way to contribute back and create that process? I love that. Yeah. Uh, means other government agencies could start to collaborate and yes. do some of the work. So I, mean, I, I think for us, internally, we, we solve the, the government agencies across Singapore. But there's a wider question about how do we bring that to this community across, you know, more globally, the, the, the public sector across globally. And you know, we, we have thought about that. I mean, but then, ideally, if we could have open source for everything, we wouldn't be going that route. In a source, you know, it's kind of like the intermediary piece. but. Not everything can be released, and we still want to be able to get the benefit. But I think as we go forward, as least on that previous diagram that I had, we're trying to push everything to the right, you know, open source as much as we can. Now, uh, most of that is sort of, sort of teaching open source, where open sourcing libraries and, and projects. Um, but I think as we go forward, and so I, I would like to see more of that. Um, but it, it, it involves trust, I think, in some ways, or comfort in the organization to start to say, you know, let's go and open source more. Let's go and move things on. All right, uh, just ask again, is Mike Webblesand in the room? No. Okay. Uh, I'm, given what we've got, I'm happy to allow Q&A. However, we are multiple tracks. So if anyone is wishing to shift to the other tracks, now is the right moment to do so. If not, we will carry on through. Questions? Sorry, I think. Uh, oh, oh, Two parts of question. And then the second, how do you get buy-in from the teams? What who you want to who you want to um, open up the code because that requires additional effort on the side, but it's not 
the beneficiary of that. <coughs> I don't think the benefit for the source, but I'll have to bring that. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, the question was, how do we get buy-in um, across different teams? Um, and I think you know that that is a big piece. And you know, a unfunded um, working group to drive this thing, we can only go so far. You know, a, a lot of my time I spent on the indoors and then working with uh, the both development teams as well as managers to convince them to, to in a source. Um, but I think the next stage is really to say when we can start to demonstrate some more value get a few more numbers to show that this is actually something we want to continue working on, um, can we get funded? Can we get a core, you know, a core team effectively in the, in the, the inner source commons pattern model of a team that will actually then be helping teams, not just about awareness, but in fact opening up their code, providing the resources to either open it as is and provide licensing and maintenance actually ongoing as well, or to sort of carve out a piece of a library that can be extracted out to a central thing. So, you know, that's the next bound. We kind of need to prove it to get there and to ask for money and then hire the right people. But I mean, that's you know, if things go well, that's the intention. So, so we've got a few other back here. I think we need to wrap. So take one more. Yeah. One more. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, could you share a little bit about the motivations why you know management uh, was so resistant and how we like how we track track the people. Not sure, sure. Um, yeah, so the, the, you know, getting a bit more of an answer, the question was about um, you know, middle management and, and, and understanding why they were so resistant to that. And really, it was it was it was not a resistance to the concept. It was resistance that they had existing projects with a huge backlog they needed to deliver, and they had funding that they needed to address. You know, sharing money becomes the kind of the bigger piece, as I'm sure a lot of organisations face as well. The budget and we get into this. If we're spending it to do something for the wider community, what are the trade-offs? And so we really need to sit down and all that through. I think conceptually they understood, um, but it really was about how do we make it easy? So we needed to come on our side, and that's why we wrote scripts to help um, at least report on best practices, and now the next step on how do we actually automate it um, becomes how do we reduce the friction for those sorts of things? Documentation is the other part. Um, but really sitting down was the only way that we could really do it and to, to talk through their concerns, to understand it more. And they're all really supportive. It's just everyone's got a million things to do and a bunch of them to balance. No easy solution, but anyway, thanks, Brian. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. This is, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you.